We love hub. I mean, I have been, you know, like almost everybody else, been eating fewer carbs. I'm not giving up carbs, or especially the fun ones. But I think you do have to acknowledge that it does take a little bit more work to keep your weight constant. I've been able to exercise more now than I did in my 30s and 40s because of my work schedule. And just learning what I needed to do and how good exercise makes me feel. I think that's been a godsend to really integrate it into my life. It can be as simple as taking a walk with the dog and, and with friends. You know, I used to jog. I jog less so now, mostly because my dogs got older. So they were less inclined to jog. It's all about the dogs. Welcome back, everyone, and a big thank you for joining us again on The Hub for our weekly discussion about all things menopausal, like me and Katari. Oh, and me, Sue Delara. Oh, and definitely me, Judy DeMello. Oh, yes, Judy, didn't you recently celebrate a big birthday? Happy birthday, Judy. <laughs> thank you. It was my big birthday. Fat 6-0. Oh. I would not say fat, Judy. Not at all. <laughs> but you can say, oh. Thank you. Um, so, you know, maybe this was a morbid thing for me to do, but I went onto a site that calculates your estimated life expectancy based on very little criteria, I might add. And? Apparently, I'll be sticking around until I'm 92. However, they did not factor in that working on this podcast is probably going to shave about 10 years off my life. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's really interesting in the context of menopause because almost all the doctors and experts who we interviewed here on The Hub point to the fact that women today can potentially spend almost half their lives in menopause. I know. I mean, let's say I do live to 92. And by the way, I'll be living with my 25-year-old tennis pro and you can all come visit me. It's the only way to go. <laughs> oh, I'll be visiting you too. <laughs> Okay, so if I do live to 92, that means I would have spent almost 40 years of that time in menopause. So it got me thinking, if we're living longer than ever, shouldn't we really be investing in our health and diet so that even though we're no longer reproductive, at least we can continue to be as productive as ever with a healthy body and mind? For sure. I mean, exercise, diet, lifestyle choices, these are things we actually have control over. Yeah, but you know, many women... I'm one of them, probably, <laughs> complain that with menopause comes low energy, new aches and pains. So saying, come on, girls, let's power through this, just isn't realistic anymore. I know. I mean, it can really be a battle. And that's why we're thrilled today to have on The Hub someone who not just fought the battle and won, but she also wrote a great book about it. Here's Judy's interview with Amanda Thee. <laughs> I am really excited today to have the opportunity to speak with Amanda Thieb, a personal trainer with vast experience in the fitness industry. Amanda is also the author of one of the most fun, no holes barred raucous books you'll ever read on menopause. It's called Menopocalypse, How I Learned to Thrive During Menopause and How You Can Too. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Judy. It's great to be here. I mean, you know, when you think of a menopause book, you don't think it's going to be fun and raucous, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't feel like it when you're in menopause. But I had to add some levity to the conversation. Yes, it's much needed. But before that, I want to know more about the title, Menopocalypse. How did you come up with that? And what was going on that led you to this apocalyptic state of mind? I was going to call it something else. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking of like the analogy about the zombie apocalypse. But then the whole point of the apocalypse is that you want to try and fight back. You want to try and do everything you can within your resource pool to sort of like be strong and be resilient. And so it comes from that. But what was going on exactly with you? 
It happened for me from a personal perspective. I've been in the fitness and wellness industry for now three decades. And so when I was 42, really fit, really healthy and feeling pretty on top of my game and actually feeling like I was a good advocate for women, you know, at, at that age saying, look, we are more capable than you think. We are strong. We are resilient. And then at 42, I just started hitting this brick wall with my health. I had really terrible symptoms of vertigo and migraines and chronic fatigue that would just have me laid out for days. I started struggling with depression. It impacted my mental health and well-being. It impacted the relationship between my husband and my children and my friends. And nobody could tell me what was going on. I just was like, is this it? Is this like the new me, the new personality, and I'm just supposed to accept this? I just couldn't work it out. And I had really good healthcare, really good doctors, and they were like, yeah, you're clearly not well, but we don't know why. And it was only when I went to see a gynecologist and he was like, is everything okay? And I started crying. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not. And he just listened to me and he was really kind and empathetic and he just said, what you're struggling with is the symptoms of perimenopause. I can help you. And it just was like a weight lifted off my shoulders. And I just thought, why did it take two years for me to get these answers? Why is it taking years and years for other women? And my story's not unique. My story's more commonplace than it is unique, right? And so I just was like, I can't be the way it is. 51% of the population are women. We're going to have a, b a billion women in menopause in a few years' time. We're living so much longer. Why is this happening? And so that's sort of what led me down the path of talking about it more in the fitness and nutrition world and just as a holistic conversation as well, and then ultimately writing the book. And how are you feeling today? The craziness of the perimenopausal symptoms have definitely died down. Menopause is different though. Like I feel different. My body's not the same. And I think that that's something that women need to just accept that you're going through a change. So things are not meant to be the same. You know, the physiology of the human species is fantastic. And menopause happens for a reason. And that we're in this new playing field now. And I like it. I like the way I feel now. So let's talk specifically about waking up. And menopause what's happening to our bodies during this time but I just want to preface this with saying that I don't love talking about weight gain and weight loss because I feel like women are so pressured to not gain weight in this world we live in we're so pressured from outside societal messaging that we should be young and thin forever and so if we're listening to messages of this stupid like idealistic like thin and young forever it can drive women down this path of restrictive dieting and eating disorders and so I'm very careful about the conversation because I appreciate that this isn't an easy topic for women. I'm trying to add some sanity to the conversation. Well, I just want to interrupt you then, because on that note, there was one section in your book that did stop me in my tracks for that same reason. And that was a section called Don't Let the Old Lady In. So it was a sweet little anecdote about your struggles to get past your hormonal uh, fatigue and symptoms and get to the other side of just feeling fit and healthy again. And I understand that part, but by you using those words, don't let the old lady in, it was perpetuating this insane focus we have on everlasting youth and youth being equated to virile and strong and the old lady being the frail and past it creature. So yeah, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but there's a story behind it. And I think I, exp I explain that well in, in the book as well. But yeah, words matter. Yeah, I know it's not the first time I've been asked that about the old lady in, but we'll let the old lady in, but she's got to be strong as anything yeah she's gonna be pumped and ripped <laughs> okay so the fact is that we as you said we do get these menopause bellies and weight shifts around but it's not just menopause I mean middle-aged men go through this as well in a way it is about uh slowing down of our metabolism so how do you coach people through this first thing I want to talk about is some new research that came out two weeks ago and it measured the metabolism as we age from the ages of 18 to the ages of 80 and they know they check male and women candidates it's the most thorough research that's been done on metabolism there is no distinct drop in our metabolism at menopause 
There is not. And we need to move away from that conversation. Yes, metabolism shifts happen all the time with diet, with lack of exercise and different things, but you've got control over those. So what we know in menopause is that estrogen impacts every system in our body. So we have receptors all over the place and they impact other hormones too. And what can happen is because of the hellish symptoms women go through, because of the impact on other hormones, our ability to exercise as regularly as we did before, to take care of the food that we eat to listen to our hunger hormones they're called leptin and ghrelin and they tell us when to eat enough and when to stop eating like when we're hungry and when we're full and they're impacted by estrogen about 70 percent of women through menopause will put on at least 10 pounds bloating is another thing food intolerances can happen in perimenopause which also seem to calm down in menopause too you know there's all of these extra hurdles that we're jumping that make weight gain easier and also weight loss harder and the last part of the puzzle is something that happens to both men and women is sarcopenia sarcopenia is the degradation of our muscle mass it inhibits us being able to build muscle as easy as easily as we did before and to maintain it and so all of these things it's not just one thing there's like a cascade of things happening estrogen impacts our cortisol response when we've got high cortisol our body wants to store fat And so when we look at weight loss, it's not just like a move more, eat less conversation. It's like, let's just look at everything. You need to see if we can get your symptoms under control. We need to see if we can get you focused back on eating nutritious foods that support your body, not restrictive dieting. We need to manage your stress so that your cortisol levels are calming down. We need to look at your insulin response because the estrogen impacts our sensitivity to insulin. And so we need to be looking at ways to improve our response which is usually lifestyle impacts like stress, sleep, the food we eat, the exercise. The answers are always the same thing, but it's never it's never one thing. It's never, this is the diet you need to do. It's never just that. And it's oversimplified, but it definitely isn't that your metabolism is broken. It's definitively not broken. Right. Okay. This is where I'm going to ask you to read a little excerpt from your book because you talk very openly about gaining weight during perimenopause. And I love the way you handled it. So I wrote a chapter in the book and it called Why I'm So Bloody Fat, right? Because it's like... It was the question that was getting asked to me all the time and I needed to dig deep and find out exactly what was going on. Okay. If I had a dollar every time a menopausal woman asked me how to lose her menopause belly, I'd be a millionaire. The statistics aren't great. According to Amos Pines, who is the former president of the International Menopause Society, he says that 9 out of 10 American women will gain weight during menopause, and around the world that number is around 70%. Women who believe they haven't changed anything in their diet or their exercise routine suddenly pile on the pounds and it doesn't seem to make any sense, which can be frustrating and demoralizing. I have always been the classic pear-shaped lady, all bum and legs, By the way, as an aside, which I like, (laughs) I've never put any weight on my tummy. In fact, I rocked a six pack for most of my 30s and into my 40s. When I entered perimenopause and my symptoms, symptoms seemed borderline aggressive, my weight stayed the same, but my body started to change shape. I started to notice that my tum tum was a wee bit softer and rounder than before and my boobs exploded in size, and I'd been hit with a dreaded back fat. (laughs) My body was now draped in the menopause flesh claw. A few years into perimenopause, I jumped on the scales and found that my weight had increased by 10 pounds. That isn't so bad, but my body had started to look unrecognizable to me, i.e. the only person that matters. Like many women, I felt confused and truthfully somewhat embarrassed by my new shape, especially when my clothes didn't fit properly anymore. Great. So what did you do? Right. So I'm trained in nutrition. I've studied nutrition science, but I just couldn't work it out. And it was like everything I was looking at and trying and reading, it didn't make sense. And so honestly, I was like, I need to lose weight. I need to know how to do this. And so I pulled back everything I learned, went back to basics and the most sensible way I could do this. First of all, I realized that It's more challenging to lose weight through perimenopause. It's not going to be like when I was 20 and I was going to Ibiza and I had six weeks so I could go, okay, I'm going to have two salads a day 
and I'm just going to like go and do three aerobics classes a day or something like that stupid, like um, move more, eat less mentality is a highly stressful environment for a perimenopause woman. What that can do, it can end up having you, your cortisol levels raging, which can lead to excess weight gain because we have it wants to store that belly fat. For the time when we get chased down the street by that saber-toothed tiger, right? Your body goes into that preservation mode, but you're also then dealing with this low energy output. So your body's depleted. And what we do then is we just keep doing more because we know in our minds we need to we incorrectly know in our minds that we need to eat less and just keep moving more. And women push, 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 and push. What the body needs in that time is it for it to rejuvenate, regenerate, and be nourished, right? So I just pulled it back. I was like, okay, I know my body needs more protein than ever. As you age and as you go through menopause, your ability to maintain and build muscle is impacted by the ability to translate amino acids from your protein into building muscle. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to eat more protein, which by virtue of being a protein fills you up more, stabilizes blood sugar and takes more calories to burn. And so it's actually one of the best type of food sources you can eat as a woman. Filled my plate up with more vegetables and then starches. Every woman and I needed carbohydrates, but carbohydrates have been fed to us as being carbs equal the devil. But what we do need to reduce and do need to pay mindful attention to are hyper palatable, overly processed foods that have high sugar, high salt and high fat content. So I just paired it back to basic nutrition. And by virtue of just me doing that, my calorie intake had reduced without needing to cut calorie count. I then queued back into things like, are you hungry? Are you eating because you're bored? We all do it. We walk past the kitchen and we start nibbling. I cut out the nibbles. I ate four meals a day, three meals and one snack. I was including lots of walks, lots of non-exercise movement. So I, I mean, I go into this in a lot of detail in the book. So these are the things that I did. And I did lose the 10 pound, but it didn't happen in three or four weeks. It took months, months and months and months. And that's what it should do. It shouldn't be quick, right? It was almost like I had to do everything. Not one thing, Judy, but all of them. All of those things had to happen together. Right. And did this also include the MMR workout? And maybe you can tell us what the MMR workout is. The MMR workouts, which I've called like menopause metabolic resistance training, because essentially I want you to do resistance training, but work the heart as well. So I wrote a 12 week workout program in the book because I wanted every woman to know that strength training is super important through menopause. And so I thought by doing it in a book with an at home, the at home workouts worked out well through COVID. A lot of women do them with a set of dumbbells or not. If you've never done strength training before, you can start with body weight training or resistance bands. And again, this is backed by data that we know helps improve bone strength. We know one in two women post-menopause are at risk of breaking a bone. And especially if a woman isn't on menopause hormone therapy, she needs to do everything within her power to improve and build bone. And strength training and um, weight-bearing exercise has been shown to do that and to even reverse osteoporosis. You're never too old to start. Do you do HRT? I am not. And it's not because I don't want to be. I've tried it and it wasn't for me. And that doesn't work for every woman. And it's not the only answer. Menopause hormone therapy is a godsend for the majority of women. I had bad reactions to it. My symptoms got worse. I went into actually a state of to paranoia and despair. And that can happen to some women. And I accepted that. And so just did the things I could do outside of that. But I am a huge proponent of it though, because I think that not enough women are even offered it as a choice. And that's wrong. Just to add in the book, there is a whole midsection of all the exercise routines and pictures of you doing the exercise, which I thought was very helpful helpful and sort of suggested schedules for people depending on your fitness level. So I think that was very helpful to see that. And do you have workout videos online as well? I do. I, I don't have many, but I have a YouTube channel and my Instagram. I always post workouts. I'm not going to suggest to a woman that she should be doing strength training or doing these workouts that are going to be challenging when she can barely make herself a cup of tea. Like I know how it feels. And so for me, I would say to a woman, the importance of the non-exercise movement, I write about this like quite a lot in the book, um, is understated in general. Get out and go for a walk. Even if you feel like crap, anyone can do a five, 10 minute walk. 
and you will always feel better at the end of it. In those days where you really feel quite energetic, I wholeheartedly pushed the seize the day message. Do the workouts because even if you're only doing them once a week or a couple of minutes a day, like 10 minutes a day, just like a snowball effect. And eventually you're going to start feeling a lot better anyway. And so it's, it's the showing up. It's doing something and believing that you can do something is my overarching message and it can look different every day. All right, so from your place of non-scientific approach to menopause, but really a wonderful just lifestyle choices approach, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a younger woman who's just about to enter menopause and go through this whole roller coaster? And I think it's the most boring answer in the world, but it's to be educated. It's to gain knowledge because knowledge gives you power to advocate for yourself. And the problem is, is women go into this blindsided. They get hit by this sledgehammer of symptoms and they go to the doctor and say, but I think I'm depressed. So the doctor treats them for depression and et cetera, et cetera. We, we can go over that conversation a thousand times. We've all heard it, but the minute that you go to, to seek help and you are educated, the playing ground is completely different. I think that if every woman could know what is going to happen before it happens, like we do with pregnancy, like we do with puberty, it would be a, a game changer. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. You're an incredible help to any woman, whether you're just about to go through menopause or perimenopause, and or to me, who is postmenopausal now, I still found it very helpful and just very sort of fun and educational. And I would highly recommend everybody just pick up this book and enjoy it. So thank you again, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me on and good luck with the podcast. She's so terrific, and I really encourage everyone to buy the book because it's full of really common sense knowledge and very doable suggestions. Also, check out Amanda Thebe on social media because she regularly posts exercise routines and nutrition tips. Especially now, we're in the new year, just after a big season of extreme eating and drinking, which is always followed by extreme dieting now in the new year. To me, it sounds like a perfect storm for messing with your already messed up hormones. And on that note, I want to share a quick story. I have been doing intermittent fasting for about two, almost Wait, two. I do intermittent fasting as well. Really? I do. I fast in between meals. <laughs> Okay, Judy. <laughs> sorry, 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 Anne. As I was saying... Yes, you do intermittent fasting, yeah. Yes, for the last two, two and a half years, I would eat for like 16 hours and some days up to 20 hours, five days a week. Why? I was trying to lose that extra eight to 10 pounds that I had put on during perimenopause and I just couldn't lose the weight. I would work out three times a week and I had extreme night sweats which I've been dealing with for 10 years. And the past two and a half years, it's gotten really bad where I would have rashes going down my chest. So then I read certain articles online. Even Amanda had mentioned that extreme dieting and not eating is not the way. So I started eating again, <laughs> having my three meals a day. And after three weeks, I mean, my night sweats are practically gone. I would say 90% gone. I haven't have extreme sweating that I'm so used to. Now I do have a slight perspiration type of sweating, but it's, it's nothing compared to what I was dealing with. And it's been six weeks now that I stopped fasting. And after three weeks, like, such a huge improvement for me. Yeah, so maybe there is a correlation between going on crazy diets and starving yourself. And sort of that just wax out your hormones. Well, definitely food for thought and definitely worth another reminder to see a specialist. Get good advice and don't do anything extreme. Be Love Hub is written and produced by Judy DeMello and Katari and Sue DeLara. Music by A Cloudy Sky, post-production assistant, Max Podcasting. Please subscribe to our show wherever you download your pods. And for more information, please visit our website, theloveHub.com. 
That's V L U V H U B dot com. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. See you next week.